Okay, let's bow our heads in prayer and commit the meeting into our Father's hands. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is a living word that speaks to us. And it is all that we need for life, uh, for instruction, uh, for training in righteousness, and for guiding us in serving you. We pray, Lord, as we look into your word this morning, that you would speak to us by the power of your spirit, and that, Lord, we'd all be fed and built up in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we finished Judges last time, so I thought we would take the pause as an opportunity to do just a one-off talk on something different. And uh, I'm going to be talking uh, uh, on the subject of apologetics and about primary and secondary doctrines. Now, I wonder if I asked anybody here, do you know what the primary doctrines of the Christian faith are? Do you know what the what secondary doctrines are? Whether you could give me a list of those or not. Um, head scratcher. And I wonder if you even know what the word apologetics means. So let's just refresh our memory. Apologe uh, the word apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, which means a verbal defense or giving a reasoned argument. And it comes from the classical legal system. And in a legal court in Greece, you would have the prosecution, which was called the categoria, and then you'd have the defense, which is the apologia. And the apologia was a speech, an explanation to answer or rebut the charges. Now, the New Testament has many examples of an apologia, a defense being made, a defense for the faith. We have one in Philippians 1, verse 7, where Paul gives, speaks in defense and confirmation of the gospel. Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ was under attack, and Paul defended it, giving an apologia, giving a verbal and reasoned argument in defense. There's another example in 1 Peter 3, verse 15, where it says... But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense, to give an apologia to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So we should be able to give, give a defense for the hope, for that which we believe in, uh, with meekness and fear. Are you able to give a defense for what you believe in? Are you able to give an account of what you truly believe? That's why I want us to look into primary and secondary doctrines this morning, so that we know exactly what we believe. So, there are primary doctrines and they are, there are second doctrines. The Christian faith is built upon the teaching of the Bible, the Old and the New Testaments. Now, in Latin, the word for teaching is doctrine. That's what doctrine basically means, teaching. And over time, doctrines have form, been formulated by Christians based upon the Word of God to articulate the teaching of Scripture and to articulate the belief of Christians. And within the realm of biblical doctrines, there are two tiers of those teaching. The primary doctrines, which are the core beliefs that are necessary to be a true Christian, that they are, they are central and, and, and essential. And then you've got secondary doctrines, which, while being important and not to be dismissed, are not essential. Now, primary doctrine determines whether you... Uh, a, well, yeah, primary doctrine is the essentials of the faith, and uh, secondary doctrine is the distinctives of a denomination. So, all Christians would believe the primary doctrines. They're the essentials of the faith. But the, the secondary doctrines tend to be what are the distinctives of a denomination. You know that some denominations believe in infant baptism, others believe in baptism by full immersion. That would be a distinctive that would maybe differentiate Church of England with a Baptist church. But both Baptist churches and Church of England churches would agree upon the essentials of faith, the primary doctrines. And it's important for us to, differ, to know and differentiate between the two. Now, it's important for us to know what primary doctrine is because it's on the basis of primary doctrine that we have fellowship with one another. It, it is these primary doctrines are what constitute salvation, what are necessary to believe to be saved, to be considered a Christian. 
And if you're not saved, if you're not Christian, if you do not subscribe to these primary doctrines, then there is no fellowship between brothers and sisters in Christ. There is no fellowship between other churches because we're not saved, because we don't have those primary doctrines. Whereas secondary doctrines does affect our fellowship, but it just affects the depth of our fellowship. The more that you're in agreement with one another, the deeper the fellowship you're able to enjoy and share. But the greater the differences upon these secondary doctrines, the more you find yourself at odds with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now much damage has been done in the body of Christ when believers dispute and divide over differences in beliefs. I'm sure we've all come into conflict when we come across our brothers and sisters in Christ and we're arguing and debating over an issue and it overspills into reviling, calling bad names and you find yourself, people who we share, uh, share faith in Christ suddenly find ourselves at odds and I'm sure that causes a lot of grief to the Holy Spirit uh, and is something that the Lord would want us to avoid. Mark was talking to us about unity and that was a subject that Emir was talking about, how we must strive to maintain that unity between brothers and sisters in Christ. And we need to know those core doctrines that we subscribe to, which constitutes our fellowship that we have unity on, but we also need to know um, those doctrines that if people do not subscribe to, that we divide from, that we separate from, because it doesn't mean that they're Christians. A clearer understanding of the differences in the doctrines, where the lines are to be drawn, and on what grounds we do and do not divide, is important. Now, someone may say, everything in the Bible is true. And then they draw a circle around the, well, and then they, um, they draw a circle, well, what they really mean is that all my interpretations of the Bible are true. So someone might say, you know, everything in the Bible is true, but what they really mean is all my interpretations of the Bible is true. And then they draw a circle around those beliefs. And if anyone disagrees with those beliefs contained in the circle, then they're declared to be in error. And uh, they're to be false. They're not even Christians, maybe. And then they divide. And what they're doing is they're dividing over secondary issues, which we shouldn't be dividing over. And they're getting themselves caught up. Now, the passion with which someone holds tightly to their beliefs is laudable, but the ignorance that creates the boundary of the circle of their beliefs is highly dangerous because it causes them to break fellowship with people that they need not break fellowship with. Therefore, it is important to define and understand what are primary doctrines, what are secondary doctrines, and where to draw the line in the fellowship we enjoy as members of the body of Christ. Now, from the early church, there has been debates over what doctrines and practices must be upheld, what doctrines are essential, and what should be considered secondary. Um, a good example of that is in Acts chapter 15 in the Council of Jerusalem, where there was debate among the various Christians at the early church there about what we should be holding to, what is essential, important, and what is put to one side. And that's the reason that creeds came into existence. Things like the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. They, they were an attempt to define what the core beliefs are and what all Christians should be united over. And then anything outside of those creeds would be considered secondary and things that we should have a little bit more grace and uh, consideration towards our brothers and sisters in Christ with. But the thing is, how do you define what a primary doctrine is and what a secondary doctrine is? What criteria must be observed in each case? Well, all doctrine must be drawn from Scripture. Whether it be a primary doctrine or secondary doctrine, it must have its source and its origin in the Word of God. But primary doctrines are clearly stated in Scripture. They cannot be refuted because they are abundantly obvious. But also, they directly affect our salvation. And by virtue of not holding these primary doctrines, we find ourselves falling foul of salvation, not being a true brother and sister in Christ. Whereas secondary doctrines can be less clear in scripture, um, but they do not affect our salvation. So they're not, not as essential. That's the way that I would, yeah, that's the way that I would do, uh, create the boundaries for the uh, defining of them. Now, there are some doctrines which are primary, 
but they have secondary doctrine elements to them. For example, an exemplary of a primary doctrine would be the return of Jesus Christ, that he is going to come to judge the living and the dead. That is a primary doctrine that is clearly dated, stated within the scriptures, but then there are specifics about how that will happen and when that will happen. Will it be a thousand year reign upon the earth? Is it... Um, is there going to be a rapture? And if so, is it going to be before the thousand years and after the thousand years? These are secondary doctrine matters, and we don't divide over those secondary doctrine matters. But if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is going to return to the earth in bodily form to reign, which is a primary doctrine, then that's a matter where we divide in fellowship because it is a core belief that we must subscribe to. And pretty much all the creeds state this as well. Now, there are... I've, done, I've been working very hard at this, trying to work out what are the core, the essential, the primary doctrines. And I've come to the conclusion that there are six essential doctrines uh, that unite believers. Regardless of church or denomination, they are clearly stated in scripture and subscription to these is essential for salvation. Now the first one is the matter of the scriptures. Scriptures are stated to be entirely inerrant and sufficient for all Christian life. The scriptures, i.e. the Bible, are entirely inerrant and sufficient for all life. Now, if you're like me, I always scratch my head and think to myself, what does it mean by inerrancy and what, do I, what does it mean by sufficiency? Inerrancy means scripture is without error. It is absolutely trustworthy and it is unable to be false or wrong and it is essential that we believe that that scripture is without error is absolutely trustworthy and, and is unable to be false or wrong sufficiency declares that scripture is the only authority we need uh, it's all we need to equip us for faith life and service and it is not to be supplemented by traditions or by additional writings or the ideas of man the Bible is all that we need. Scripture is all that we need for doctrine and for right understanding. Of course, the scripture that we would quote to support this would be 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. We all know it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And... The reason I put this one first is that all other doctrines come from this. If you do not believe in the inerrancy and the sufficiency of scripture, then your doctrines are coming from other sources, other places, other people. And you find that within the cults where the doctrines and beliefs are based upon the teachings of the person who founded that leader and so forth. We must believe uh, in the inerrancy and sufficiency of scripture because all other doctrines come out of that. So that's almost the most important doctrine for us to believe and hold to. And if we find that we have other people in other churches that do not hold the authority of the word of God, then it is grounds for us to divide from those people. The second doctrine that I think is a primary doctrine is the Trinity, that God is one in being, but three in person. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The three make up the Godhead. All Christians down through the ages have held firmly to the Trinity, uh, the triune nature of God, that is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, all, and uh, all three persons of the Godhead are equally God, but they possess attributes and deity and individual personality. Now, there's not a single verse or passage in scripture that contains the word Trinity or communicate the concept of three in one God. But if you put the whole of scripture together, it is clearly stated time and time again. In Matthew 28, verse 19, um, Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And here we see all three members of the Godhead spoken of in a way where they occupy the same authority in the matter of baptism. And it speaks of unity and co-equality in the Godhead. 
Um, when it comes to God the Father, 2 Corinthians 1.3 says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Speaking of the Father, there it says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Father is God. In Titus 2, verse 13, it says, Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. There, Jesus Christ is declared to be God as well. There are other passages. And in Luke 1, verse 35, it says, The angel answered and said to her, her being Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And what it is saying is, when the Holy Spirit comes upon Mary, it is actually the power of the Most High. It's the power of God coming upon her. And it's equating the work of the Holy Spirit with God himself coming on her. And the result is the Son of God. The result of God coming upon Mary is the Son of God is born. And it is stating that the Holy Spirit is God. There are other verses as well. So throughout Scripture, you'll find lots of evidences that both the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God. And it is an essential doctrine, a fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. And if we find that we're in a company of those who do not hold to the Trinity, then it is reasons for us to divide for them. It is a fundamental primary doctrine of the Christian faith. The next one is the person of Jesus Christ. Now this declares that Jesus Christ is fully man and fully God that he is 100% God and 100% man for all eternity. It is what's called in theological circles the hypostatic union. And Jesus declared his deity during the feast of dedication in the hearing of the Jewish leaders in the temple when he said in John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. Now, if we cast might want to cast doubt upon what he meant there the Jews bring clarity to us because they said then the Jews took up stones again to stone him and Jesus answered them many good works I have shown you from my father for which of those works do you stone me and the Jews answered him saying for a good work we do not stone you but for blasphemy and because you being a man make yourself God the Jews clearly understood that when Jesus said, I and my Father are one, Jesus was declaring himself to be God. Now, at different points of history, not only is the deity of Jesus Christ being brought into question and challenged, but the humanity of Jesus Christ has been challenged by overstating his deity. And so, John, in the opening of his gospel, makes it very clear that God is both 100% God, sorry, Jesus is both 100% God and 100% man. Because he says, in the beginning, the word was, sorry, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Then in verse 14, he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So there we see clearly in the beginning of John's gospel that Jesus is both God and man. And the doctrine of the incarnation, which is a subset of this doctrine, um, teaches that God became flesh, that God assumed a human nature and became a man in the form of Jesus Christ, and that the Son of God, uh, the second person of the Trinity, Christ, was truly God and truly man. And it is essential to believe this for salvation. I mentioned this uh, on Monday night. If you do not believe that Jesus Christ was God, he was just a man like you and I. And if he was a man like you and I, that means he has the same sinful nature as you and I. He was not qualified to be our saviour. He had to be somebody completely innocent and free from sin to, to be able to be our substitutionary sacrifice. If he's not 100% God, uh, God and 100% man, then he cannot be our sacrifice. It is an essential doctrine. If people do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, or his full humanity as well, then there are people that we divide with. It's a primary doctrine. I've mentioned it already, but the return of Jesus Christ, that is the physical return of Jesus Christ in glory to reign on earth and to judge the living and the dead. That is a primary doctrine. The return of Jesus Christ, now, it is a broad series of teachings that takes up large portions of scripture. I mean, I think I've done 35 talks alone in the book of Revelation on Monday nights, which shows you how broad and deep the subject is. So there's lots of subsets to this doctrine, things that we would put into the category of secondary. 
doctrine. But at its heart, this doctrine states that life does not end at death, that both believers and unbelievers will be resurrected and be judged. The believer will enter into eternal life, the unbeliever into eternal death. And this will occur when Jesus Christ returns physically in body form to the earth, he returns in glory to reign upon the earth. In short, we do not go up with God, God comes down to be with us. Emmanuel, God with us. And this is the hope and the belief of all true believers in Jesus Christ. And the doctrine has so many scriptures to speak of relating to this that it's impossible to, to refute and to even choose a scripture to quote. But I do like Job 19, where he says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed. This I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Job, this was more than, for Job, this was more than a doctrine. He knew this in his innermost being. He knew that after his physical death, he would see my Redeemer in the flesh, in a resurrected body, and his heart yearned. It was a hope that held him. And it's a, it's a hope that should hold us too, looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, in 2 Timothy 4.1, we read, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Paul spoke of the Lord, return of the Lord Jesus Christ as an absolute certainty that he will come to judge the living and the dead. And to not believe in the return of Jesus Christ is not to believe in an afterlife, is to not believe in judgment, to not believe in um, eternal eternal punishment or eternal life in which case what point is there in salvation what point is there being christian if there's no eternal life there's nothing to look forward to this is essential to be a christian and if people do not believe in the return of the lord jesus christ to earth in bodily form then we divide with them specifics we can we can have fellowship with and not worry about but uh, when it comes to the matter of the return it is essential Arguably the most important doctrine is the gospel of salvation. The threefold work of Christ that brings salvation to mankind, that Christ died for our sins, Christ was buried, and that he rose again on the third day. This is most succinctly spoken of, of course, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4, where Paul says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you and which you received. So he's talking about the gospel that he preached to the Corinthians and that they received. And he says, in which you stand and in which you are being saved. The Corinthians were saved by holding to the gospel. And if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Note there that he says this is of first importance. Paul makes this a primary doctrine by saying it's of first importance. And it is by virtue of this gospel that Jesus died, was buried and rose again, that the Corinthians were saved, by, by which all men are saved. If you do not believe the gospel, then you are not saved. That's why it's of first importance. Now, the gospel includes the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And some people place the resurrection of Jesus Christ as a primary doctrine in and of itself, and they're right to do so. Just because of being concise, I've drawn these all together. You see, <laughs> um, the gospel and the resurrection are uh, inseparable. Both depend upon each other. You can't have one without the other. But it is essential to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. It was the resurrection from the dead that proved that Jesus Christ's sacrifice was accepted and received by heaven. If he has not been raised from the dead, then the sacrifice is in vain. It means nothing and we're just, we're on a hiding to nothing really. And then the sixth primary doctrine is the means of salvation. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, 
in Christ alone. Salvation is by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. This is very important. Of course, it speaks about it in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, where Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And Paul makes it very clear that, uh, that um, salvation is a gift. It's not something that you earn. It's not the product of your works, of service. It is a gift from God. It's not derived from the effort of man. It's solely the gift of God. Man is helpless to save himself from sin. You see, he is dead in his sin. Cut off from God, without hope in this world. And that there is no work he can perform, there is no religious service he can render that can earn him salvation. He is entirely lost apart from Christ. That God alone can save a man from sin and judgment, it is a sovereign work of God, accomplished through the death, burial and resurrection of his son. And that salvation is offered to the whole of mankind freely as a gift. And that free gift is received by faith by believing in the work of the cross, by believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In short, salvation is not earned uh, and thus deserved. It is believed and received. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. So these are the six primary doctrines. These are essential to believe for salvation. These are essential for us to embrace, for us to, for us to have unity together as, as brothers and sisters in Christ. If any one of these are rejected, then your salvation is in question and we do not have unity. It's important to recognise this. Now we come to secondary doctrines. And I've come up with ten secondary doctrines. I'm not going to go into them in any great detail. You can see what they are right here. Now these are things where different denominations, different groups, church groups might differ and have different views. And it's important to have our views, to know what we believe and to be able to argue and defend it. But we don't divide over these matters. You know, for, for when we talk about end times, we've already mentioned that we believe in the return of Jesus Christ, but the specifics of that might differ between church and Christian. We, when it comes to eternity security, some believe that your salvation is secure, that it cannot be lost. Other people believe that you can lose your salvation. There's a debate between Arminianism and Calvinism about this issue, but you don't divide over that. I think we've got a very good example in John Wesley and George Whitfield, because George Whitfield was an ardent Calvinist and John Wesley was an ardent Arminianist and yet they were close friends throughout their entire life. They were both used powerfully of God to reach, share the gospel both in this country and abroad. And they regularly met and regularly prayed. And when George, and George Whitfield was so humble, he laid down the Methodist movement that he started and gave it to John Wesley, a man whom he disagreed with on multiple secondary issues. But he gave it to him to carry on. And so we always think of John Wesley as the founder of Methodism. No, it was George Whitfield, but he handed it over to John Wesley, even though they disagreed upon some very important issues. This is a tremendous lesson for us, that secondary issues, secondary doctrines should not divide us. Some people have differing views about Israel, whether Israel has, still has a place in God's future plans and purposes. Some people believe that the church has replaced Israel. I think it's a very important matter but it's not something that we divide over. People have different views about demons, whether Christian can have a demon or can't have a demon, whether, whether and what spiritual warfare looks like, we don't divide over that issue. But it does affect the depth of our fellowship. Creation, some people believe that God created the world literally in six days, some people believe it was six long periods of time, sometimes people believe that God used evolution. I think these things are very important, because I think some of these things are clearly stated in scripture, but it doesn't affect your salvation, what you believe. So we might have a difference of opinion and it might affect the depth of our fellowship, but we don't divide over that. Some people observe the Lord's Supper weekly, some people do it monthly, some people use bread, some people use unleavened bread, some people use wine, some people use grape juice, we don't divide over that. Bible versions, some people are King James only, other people like to use the New American Standard, the NIV, the ESV, don't divide over that. 
baptism. I do think, personally, that baptism is, a, is, is undertaken by believers. And, uh, you know, baptism without belief is just a bath. But there are other people that believe that an infant could be baptised and that's legitimate. And they will argue from the scripture to be able to do that. Even though there might be a difference of opinion there, we don't divide over the issue, but it does affect the depth of fellowship that we have. Church structure. Some people believe that the church should be run by a plurality of elders, other by a single person at the front. Some people think, uh, have different ideas with, uh, about church structure. Don't divide over that. And spiritual gifts, of course. Some people believe that gifts are alive and active today. Other people believe, no, they would died out with the early church. We don't divide about divide over that. And I know people who I differ with on all of these issues, and I'm still able to enjoy fellowship with them. But there's a degree to which that fellowship is able to be enjoyed. I just wanted to highlight these two different camps so that we know exactly what we believe, what is fundamental and important, what is primary and what we hold to, and what is secondary. And uh, we can... Um, we can be flexible about. Now, you can look at something like if we compared those primary doctrines with Buddhism, for example, they reject the scriptures, they reject the Trinity, they reject the deity of Jesus Christ, they reject the return of Christ, they reject the gospel of Christ, and they don't believe in f uh, salvation by faith, they believe in reincarnation. So we have no fellowship with Buddhist Buddhists whatsoever. We're in complete disagreement with them. Likewise with Islam, they reject the scriptures, they reject the Trinity, they say that Jesus is not God, that he's just a prophet, they reject the return of Jesus Christ, they reject the gospel, and they have a work-based salvation. So we have no fellowship with Muslims either. They are a completely different uh, religion, no fellowship with them whatsoever. What about Jehovah's Witnesses? Surely we're a little bit closer to them, aren't we? Well, when it comes to scripture, they don't believe in the inerrancy and the sufficiency of scripture. In fact, they've got their own translation, but they sub sub substitute it with other writings, the teachings of the Watchtower organization. So scripture is undermined. They reject the Trinity. They don't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. They've got another Jesus. When it comes to the return of Jesus Christ, they do believe in the return of Jesus Christ, but it's rather convoluted and not the clear teaching of scripture. Um, they have another gospel and their means of salvation is work-based as well. So there's so many differences there that we have no fellowship with Jehovah's Witnesses. What about Latter-day Saints, Mormons? Again, they undermine the scripture because they, um, they add to it the Pearl of Great Price, the Book of Mormon and other things which are equally authoritative. So undermines that. They don't believe in the Trinity. That is undermined in their understanding. They do believe in Jesus Christ, but it's another Jesus, it's not the same. And the return of Jesus Christ, they do believe in the return of Jesus Christ, but they don't believe he's going to return to Israel, they believe he's going to return and establish his kingdom in America, which makes me smile. Interestingly enough, they do believe in the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, their means of salvation is not through, uh, by grace, through faith in Christ alone. It is a work-based salvation. So there's enough differences there for us not to have fellowship with the Latter-day Saints, with Mormons. What about Roman Catholicism? Surely we have fellowship with um, Roman Catholics. Well, yes, they do say that they subscribe to the inerrancy and sufficiency of Scripture, but also their doctrine comes with papal authority and they look to the church as an authority co-equal with the scripture and when it comes to what the bible says and what tradition says often enough it is tradition that trumps what the bible says so that is undermined they do accept the trinity they do believe in jesus christ being 100 percent god 100 percent man they do believe in the return of jesus christ although they do re reject millennialism um, and they do believe in the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But of course, when it comes to salvation, it is a works-based salvation. You know, salvation is, yes, by faith, they say, but it's also by good works. There's baptismal regeneration. You need to be baptised to be saved. 
Um, you, you get saved by observing the sacraments, by observing penance and indulgences. There's a lot more to it, the salvation. And because of this, because they disagree upon that, we, we do not have fellowship with Roman Catholics, in my opinion. There is enough differences there for us to divide. With the rest of our brothers and sisters in Christ in church Christian denominations, I like the, writing, the words here of Rupertus Maldininus. And he said, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. And I think that's a good uh, working modus operandi. The essentials being the primary doctrines, the non-essentials being secondary doctrines, and then we've got to have charity, love and grace towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. It is important that we know what we believe, that we are ready and able to offer a defense for what we believe. And it is important that we maintain unity with our brothers in Christ and not divide over secondary issues and get ourselves caught up in arguments and fights and disputes. You know, in 1 Corinthians 1.10, Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there is no divisions among you, but that you, perfectly, that you are perfectly united in mind and thought. And I think it would be do well to take to heart what uh, Paul says there. And so, what I thought might be nice for us to do is close by standing and reciting the Apostles' Creed out loud to one another and firmly declare what we believe. So, shall we stand? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you very much. You can be seated. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for these doctrines. Lord, please help us to become more fully acquainted with what we believe and why we believe it, and help us to maintain unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, help us not to get involved in arguments and debates which causes a severing of fellowship but help us to be gracious and kind to one another. In Jesus' name, amen.